If that's okay, we're going to get going here with okay, cool. With our opening, we have some new music today. We have a, a new musician. Woo I'd like to welcome Tony Hamilton. He's going to start us off with an opening song. Let's see, do we do? Do we do our? Um, yeah, you go ahead and start first. I'm, I'm, I don't know what's wrong with me this morning. I'm getting a little confused. But yeah, Tony, take it away with what you're going to open us up with today. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Please, God. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet. Guide my feet while I run this race. Cause I don't want to run this race in vain. Hold my hands while I run this race. Oh, won't you hold my hand while I run this race? Please hold my hand while I run this race. Cause I don't want to run. In vain, stand by me while I run this race. Oh, stand by me while I run this race. Stand by me while I run this race. Cause I don't want to run this race in vain. Guide my feet while I run this race. Oh, won't you guide my feet while I run this race? Guide my feet. While I run this race, cause I don't want to run this race in lifts you right up. Oh, thank you, Tony. So I, I would like to invite our practitioner of the day, Reverend Leslie Massapus, to do our opening prayer, our invocation. And uh, take it away, Leslie. Good morning. Oh, and so we take a breath and join together at the beginning of this service right here and now. We give thanks for this wonderful day 
a day created by God that we can once again participate in, knowing that it is going to be absolutely delightful and a joy. And we know that each of us is on our own life pathway. And we are so blessed to be able to be here today and to have each other help as we go down that pathway. Knowing that this morning with this lesson, that we turn our focus to a greater understanding of how that power works in our life, what it is, and how we can use it. We're so grateful to have this opportunity to come together and share in this experience, knowing that it is all spiritually directed and guided. So we let it happen. We let the joy and the love move forward from us and express to its max as we move forward with this lesson. And so it is. Sorry about that. Wrong, wrong frame. Here you go. L Leslie, you're muted, hon. Our quote from this morning comes from Desmond Tutu. And he wrote, if we could but recognize our common humanity, that we do belong together, that our destinies are bound up in one another's, that we can be free only together, that we can be human only together. Then a glorious world would come into being where all of us lived harmoniously together as members of one family, the human family. So thinking about our togetherness and our connected, please join me in a moment of silence. We now come back to this Zoom room. <laughs> and we say July's affirmation. I am free with the freedom of God. Today, I manifest this freedom in joy. I see myself free, complete, and perfect. I affirm that God's freedom is my freedom. I enter into this freedom with complete abandonment and a sincere desire to live so that my freedom shall be imparted to others. And so it is. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much. And now we go back to Tony. Tony's gonna um, bring us a, a, another inspirational musical piece. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. I love myself the way I am. There's nothing I need to change. I'll always be the perfect me. There's nothing to rearrange. 
I'm beautiful and capable of being the best me I can. And I love myself just the way I am. I love you the way you are. There's nothing you need to do. When I feel the love inside myself, it's easy to love you. Behind your fears, your radiant tears, I see a shining star. And I love you just the way you are. I love the world the way it is, for I can clearly see that all the things I judge are done by people just like me. So till the birth of peace on earth that only love can bring, ah, help it grow by loving everything. I love myself the way I am and still I want to grow. But change outside can only come when deep inside I know. I'm beautiful and capable of being the best me I can. And I love myself just the way I am. I love myself just the way I am. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that song. And so beautifully sung a cappella there. Love it. Oh, well, good morning. Good morning to all. Um, welcome to One Heart, One Mind Center for Spiritual Living's online Sunday service on this beautiful second Sunday in July. And uh, today we continue our theme of relationships. Uh, last week, I kicked off the theme by focusing on how we, as human beings, are hardwired for relationship. That we, we really know our world through relationship. We're born into relationship with everything and in both the invisible, our inner world of consciousness, and the visible world, the world of form. You know, I quoted a minister last week um, and an author, his name was Michael Dowd, and he teaches that, um, that life is nested and relational. And by that, he means that we are in relationship with living systems that are much smaller than us, you know, subatomic particles, atoms, cells, organs, and we are in relationship with with systems that are much larger than we are, weather cycles, water cycles, the atmosphere, moon, stars, galaxy, the universe. And we as human beings are nested right in the middle, dependent on both, interwoven in this amazing tapestry of life. You know, we're always in relationship to everything. And as human beings, we connect with and we understand everything through our relationships with it, whatever it is, whatever it may be, that's how we know ourself and our world. So I connect with you and understand you through our shared home humanity and all of the things that we share through our human experience, you know, love, grief, sorrow, pain, joy, bliss. I know these things intimately through my humanness 
just like you do. We share, we have that bond, we have that commonality. And I also connect and understand with you through our shared divinity, our common source and our common bond of love. And these experiences connect us. And, and last week, I also talked about how we as human beings tend to personify non-human things. Our source, God, we, we do that all the time. We personify it that so that we can be in relationship and understand it better because we know our world through relationship. And the human beings have always done this. You know, we tell stories about life and our experience with it to create connections between us so that we can understand our world and, and ultimately understand ourselves in a deeper way. You know, as a nation, we just celebrated our 246th birthday. And the United States of America has gone through a lot of growing pains in those 246 years. And thankfully, we're still a work in progress. But one of the major characteristics or attributes that I've noticed and that I think our country is founded on is, and I think it's still alive in us today, is this idea of rugged individualism. You know, we value personal liberty and self-reliance and resourcefulness. You know, we, we strive for personal freedom. We all do. And when I think of our, our founding an ancestors, I always want to include the women. We usually say founding fathers. I think it's our ancestors. Let's not leave out an entire gender. You know, I see these qualities. You know, I think of people making that long and dangerous journey across the ocean in pursuit of religious freedom, you know, and I think of the, the brave men and women who claimed their independence from England by announcing that they believed the fundamental rights of all humans were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And at the time, not all people were included, but I also think of people like Frederick Doug Douglass and Harriet Tubman who enslaved people as well. And I think of the pioneers embarking on that dangerous journey across the Oregon Trail. When I was a, a fourth grade teacher, I taught in Oregon, I taught the Oregon Trail. And, oh man, these people had a challenge in front of them, but they were sustained by their dreams of a new life and by new opportunities. And, and I think of the Native Americans who courageously fought to protect their homes. They, you know, this this was a, a grave um, endeavor for them. And I think of, when I think of new thought and the philosophy that I teach and live my life by, I think of the transcendentalists who were the forerunners of new thought, who stressed self-reliance through independent thinking. And, and I think of the civil rights leaders in the endless march of equality and justice to include everyone in this vision for America, a march that's still going on today. We are a nation of strong and courageous people. And these ideas are alive in us. And, and I like the idea of rugged individualism. It feels empowering. It's kind of a can-do attitude. And in many ways, I have personally, this, this idea, this feeling of rugged individualism, this can-do attitude has served me well, personally, throughout my life, you know, I've attempted and, and many times succeeded at doing difficult and, and unconventional things with this independent thinking. And I think it served our country well, too. You know, it, it's given us a sense of innovation. It's allowed us to accomplish hard things. You know, I think about the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, built in the Depression era when people needed to feel empowered to feel like we could do something. You know, I think of landing on the moon. But I can't think, I can't help but think, if, taking all this into consideration that this is the attitude in which our nation was founded on and we celebrate individual thinking. But I can't help but think that the time has come for us to take that spirit of rugged individualism, of self-reliance, as, as Emerson called it, and to expand it to include more. 
to see through our oneness and, and to come together in a, a collective consciousness for good. You know, I, I think of the ideals that Centers for Spiritual Living has laid out in our global vision. You know, each of us empowered and responsible for the collective transformation of our world. I have a little expert excerpt from the global vision. It's actually the second line in, in our global vision that reads, we see a world in which each and every person lives in alignment with his or her highest spiritual principle, emphasizing unity with God and connection with each other. A world in which individually and collectively, we are called to a higher state of consciousness and action. You know, and when I look around and see the division in our country right now, and actually the world, I think that it's time for us to consciously see through our collective eyes of oneness, see through peace and love and connection, cooperation, and, and to practice seeing in terms of this oneness. We know that there is only one life and that we are all living in it. And, and we, when we see through our oneness, we see our relationship to the whole, to all of creation, to everyone. In Science of Mind, we teach that we are these amazing individualized expressions of a universal source, God, spirit, the all it is, um, the thing itself, as Ernest Holmes, our founder, called it. Um, and he wrote in Living the Science of Mind, not in the Science of Mind book, but I love Living the Science of Mind because it kind of uh, breaks things down a little better. But he wrote in Living the Science of Mind, there is no such thing as an individual, oh wait, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. We are, we individualize the universal and universalize the individual. I'm gonna say that again, because it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. We individualize the universal and universalize the individual. And he wrote, this may sound rather an abstract statement until we understand its simplicity. It does sound like an abstract statement. But I believe it's time that we focus on universalizing our individual um, connection with the whole. Does that make sense? To come together in our oneness. And then Holmes actually went on to say, there is no such thing as an individual anything in the universe. For instance, we as individuals do not have an individual gravitational force that holds us in place. We do not possess an individual law of mathematics or a principle of harmony. Rather, we are immersed in all these things and they individualize through us in accord with the use we make of them. We're part of this grander whole and we individualize this grander whole through our humanness. And I interpret this as Holmes' way of saying that we live in a nested in a relational uh, universe. I'm sorry, I'm tripping over my tongue for some reason today. We are one with it. And as I talked about last week, the foundational relationship for all relationships we have is the one that we have with ourselves and ultimately, the relationship we have with ourselves is the relationship we have with our creator because we're one. And the best way I know to get in touch with that primary foundational relationships with ourselves and God is through the experience of love because love is universal. Love is the energy of the universe. Love is what connects us to everything. It's the connective tissue, the connective thread it really is all about the love vibe. You know, we, this is our, our source. You know, we often use love as a synonym for God. Uh, author Ken Wilbur wrote this. To find meaning in life, fundamental meaning, it is to find that the very processes of life itself generate joy. Meaning is found not in outward actions or possessions, but in the inner, I love this line, in the inner radiant currents of our own being and in the release and relationship of these currents to the world, 
to friends, to humanity at large, and to the infinite itself. This is what I'm talking about when I say that we consciously connect with the greater whole. This is the sentiment that I believe we are now called to foster as, as one consciousness, a deep inner realization of our value and our worth through the experience of universal love and, and to foster a willingness to share it with everyone, with all life, to universalize the individual because we experience love right here at our point of expression. You know, in the moment we really understand that everyone is an individualized expression of God, it really calls us to a deeper understanding and a practice of how we relate to each expression of the one, of the whole. It calls us to a greater compassion and, and a more convicted, convicted and really a more committed practice to experiencing our own oneness and sharing it with the whole, which is exactly what Jesus instructed his disciples to do. I, I ran across this, I thought, oh, this is perfect. In, um, oh, let's see, where do I have it? In Matthew 25, uh, Jesus said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you visited me. So he's speaking in this kind of collective way. And then the next line is, um, then the righteous will answer him. So the disciples say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you, give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger or take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or visit you? And Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, whether you did, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. So he's, he's instructing us that whenever we do anything for someone else, we do it for the whole. We individualize. We universalize the individual. We start here. You know, in, in my life, as I have consciously committed myself to my spiritual journey, you know, there have been times, and this is probably true for you as well, both in times of deep meditation and in times when I felt deeply connected to nature or to another human being or another animal, certainly I feel it when I'm with, with, with my dogs, when I felt a love that's so intense that I can feel it in my whole body, you know, it, it literally lightened me up. You know, have you ever felt that? And the more consciously I practice feeling this intense sense of love and connection, the easier it is for me to call it up, to feel it when, um, when I would like to feel lighter. The more I, and the more I feel it, the more I realize that this love vibe, as I'm calling it, is who we are. And I gotta say, it's pretty difficult not to love yourself when you realize that this is who you truly are. And, and these, and, and then loving ourselves allows us to kind of open up to the, to the love of, of universal presence, that the universal presence that is in everywhere and in everyone and in everything, it's everywhere. It's through self-love that we recognize that all life, everything is made of this love stuff, this love vibe, this infinite love vibe, as I'm calling it. And this is how we move into a more collective experience of love for everyone and everything. And I believe this is what will allow us individually, but collectively to transform our world, kind of from an us against them perspective to a just us perspective. So I believe the lessons of self-love are the first steps toward transforming our world, to know that we're love. It's who we are. And, and to be in the moment and, and feel love. You know, it feels like bliss in our bodies. You know, self-love teaches us that feeling love for ourselves is, is appropriate and right. And, and we experience God's love, I believe, in direct 
proportion, in direct relationship to how we love ourselves. And being in the moment and feeling love in our own being, it actually changes the way that other people respond or react to us without us even saying a word. Because as Holmes told us, love knows only love. Love knows only love. When I am radiating that love vibe, that's what I'm going to attract. First of all, that's the way the law works. That's what happens. We attract that into our, into our lives, into our experience. And the more we feel love for ourselves, the more we align with our true being, and the more we see the same in others. You know, I get this email once a week from this wonderful minister. His name is Scott Aubrey. And every week, um, he sends out quotes and stories. And anyway, he had this wonderful story this week that I thought, wow, that really, really kind of goes right to the heart of what I'm trying to, to the message that I'm really um, conveying today. It kind of speaks of that connective love that begins from within us. Anyway, I'm just going to read his words because he wrote it so brilliantly. He wrote, when I was eight years old, I caught myself on fire one morning getting ready for school. We had an open flame gas heater in the bathroom that I stood too close to. You know what they say when this happens, stop, drop and roll. Well, I used a different strategy, scream and run like hell. <laughs> Dad tackled me in the kitchen, threw himself on me, smothered the flames with his body and with his hands, and as he was on top of me, I remember looking into dad's face and I knew I was going to be okay. I knew that he was saving me. Ever since that day, when I would look into his face, into the eyes of my father, I knew that I was going to be okay. That's a true story. And it's a metaphor. Look into the face of your father, your mother. Look into the eyes of people who love you and know that you are going to be okay. You are not alone. Spirit will throw itself on the fire for you. Your dad, mom, friends, people in this, in this community will throw themselves on the fire for you. We are here to save each other. But if you feel that there's no one who will do that for you, then you be the savior. Find yourself, find something in common to love with others. Deepen those relationships. Throw yourself on the fire for someone else. We are never alone. And that made me tear up a little bit. We're never alone. God, spirit, the all that is, is the changeless truth of our being. It is always present. You know, I often like to say that God's got our back. Rob always teases me about that, but he's not online today. So as I continue to consciously foster these moments of intense and palatable, and it really is palatable. You can feel it in your body. Love in my life. I see that in every situation, we really have two choices. There's really two things going on. We can see from the perspective of our, of our humanness, of our human self, the ego, if you will. I won't get into that. Sometimes I think the ego gets a bad rap, but we can see it from that perspective, just from I am an individual, you are an individual. And, and, and the other way, that, the other choice we have is to see from the perspective of our larger self, you know, our true self, the witness self, I like to call it. That, that part of us that really knows that only the love is real, you know, which, which puts us at choice. You know, we can see it through the eyes of our human self or our God self. We're at choice to refrain from passing judgment or not. We can forgive or we can resent. We can stand in love or we can stand in fear. We're always at choice. And sometimes it can get a little tricky because we are human. <laughs> so a while ago, I bought this book on Kindle. Somebody recommended it to me and I actually never even read it. it it's called The Only Lesson. It's by a man named Bill McKenna. And uh, as I was looking for inspiration for today, as I so often do when I'm preparing my talk, I found this story in a chapter that's called, I love this, why is everyone being so nice to me? <laughs> Which really kind of brings home the point that I'm trying to make about humanity as a collective consciousness. You know, while we understand that we're individual expressions, 
I truly believe that the time has come for us to begin to think from a more collective whole, a more collective consciousness, so that we can collectively transform our world. I know that that seems kind of almost impossible and really daunting when we look at it from our human view. But the more that we all believe that is possible from the larger view, the more certain it is to happen. Anyway, McKenna talks about cultivating that presence of love within in his book, you know, living from the love vibe. And here's his experience. I'm just going to read his words because I thought it was kind of cute. A remarkable thing started happening to me when I was able to maintain this feeling of, of love inside of me. Everything around me, everyone around me changed. The known hostels suddenly wanted to talk to me and would go out of their way to see me. Admirals, garbage men, billionaires, 7-Eleven clerks all just wanted to talk. People everywhere just smiled. I laughed after my latest visit to the infamous DMV. I had to go to four different windows and you would have thought that I was at the Ritz Carlton because every clerk smiled at me and was so pleasant. <laughs> you know, and that's really the truth. How funny that we have to be surprised when, why is everyone being so nice to me? You know, a world that works for everyone requires a lot of consciousness that has never existed before. But you know what? We live in a world that has never existed before. And because of this, as I said, I truly believe that we are called to connect, to see from this perspective of the whole in a new way. You know, we're called to connect to each other in, in new and powerful ways, you know, to communicate, to collaborate, to cooperate with each other in wonderful and meaningful ways, ways that nurture and empower and recognize and engage with one, with one another. The Good Samaritan story just flashed into my head, you know, the, to care for each other in ways that we might be tempted to just pass by. And the best way to do this is through our connection to the unconditional, unchangeable, unshakable power of love that's within it, to cultivate that presence within ourselves daily, maybe even minute by minute, so that we can feel it for ourselves, feel it for our creator, and feel it for each other. You know, I want to leave you with one last idea, and it's the idea of loving kindness. Loving kindness is a, a common term for what in the Buddhist tradition is known as metta, M-E-T-T-A. Metta is usually translated as loving kindness, but a more accurate de definition, as I looked it up and, and researched it a bit, is, is really a loving force of connection. It's really about our relationship with life. And loving kindness is having that bone deep recognition that our lives are connected. It's the understanding that no matter what we've gone through and no matter who we are or what our history is or whatever we look like from the outside, there is within us that thread of connection and the infinite possibility for, for freedom just like our founding fathers tried to fight with their rugged individualism for growth and clarity and love. Loving kindness is a practice that affirms the truth of our being. It's, it's really a practice of generosity, a generosity of spirit, which is really the life that is always moving through us. Um, it's, it connects us and it puts us in conscious relationship to spirit, to our source, God, whatever you want to call that, to ourselves and to each other. So I invite you to practice that this week, to practice nurturing that, that loving kindness within you, that spirit of connection from that loving presence within you. And you probably heard this. I'm going to ask you to um, say this affirmation or, or sing this affirmation this um, week as you go through your life. You probably heard Karen Drucker, Drucker's chant, uh, Loving Kindness. <laughs> and it says, let me see if I can sing it. 
it's all right. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. And may I be happy. And then we change it to see others. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be happy. And then we bring it all together. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be peaceful and at ease. May we be happy. And I'll just let that be my closing prayer. And so it is. <laughs> Do y'all know that Karen Drucker song? I love that song. It's so beautiful. All right. Well, it is now time for conscious giving. And I would really like to encourage you to give generously to our center. I'm going to, we're, we're, we're moving out of our uh, pandemic area era, and we would like to do some more in-person social events, both social, educational, spiritual, and um, and we appreciate your generosity. And I'm gonna let's see. I believe Jean is going to lead us in our sacred giving and. Let's see, I'll put up the screen for you, Jane, if I can find it here. Are you, are you there yet? There you are now. All right. Wonderful. So this is our opportunity to join in the powerful act of circulation. Um, and there's a few ways that we can, can participate in that. And one way is through Venmo. And the user profile that you want to look for is at uh, o h o m center and of course you can always mail checks into the uh, assistant treasurer and his uh, mailing address is in, in the uh, chat there so let's go ahead and join together in our affirmation of sacred giving i recognize that all supply flows from the divine givingness of spirit my gift is a continuation of this divine flow. I give and receive from the infinite supply. I give in faith, in love, and in joy. And it flows back to me in kind. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you, Gina. We'll come back to you for the benediction, but um, Yvonne is going to give us some announcements. <laughs> Do, 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 do. <laughs> uh, Monday evening is group prayer at 6 to 6.20. Please join us and come together to offer silent prayer for our center. It feels really nice to do that as a group. Tuesday from 6 to 7, our learning group meets to continue our exploration of spiritual economics by Eric Butterworth. We will be discussing chapter seven, which is how to reverse financial adversity. And the discussion is facilitated by Reverend Michelle and by practitioner Raylene Clark. And you are welcome um, to come even if and join us, even if you haven't read the book, if it, you would still understand everything we're saying. And we are very um, high, high niche there, but you'd still understand it. <laughs> Um, see the newsletter to learn about a free practitioner session with Jean Perkle. It's a wonderful chance to have a full-blown practitioner session, all at no cost to you. And she's good at it, too. She won't admit it, but she is. <laughs> well, maybe she'd admit it. <laughs> um, unscheduled income is still coming in. Um, get involved and you'll experience the feeling of full-time unscheduled income and it's pretty darn cool it's fantastic even see the newsletter if you need to know more about how it works and last but certainly not least 
on Saturday, 7-16, the 16th of July, there will be Bunko Fun at the community center where the masochists live. And you can see the newsletter for all um, who are encouraged to come. This, this newsletter will tell you where, where, how to figure out how to get there and how it works. I think that's all. I just bought a bunch of Bunko toys, so you got to come. Well, there we go. <laughs> how can you miss Bunko toys? <laughs> we'll have snick snacks and prizes probably. We'll figure it out. <laughs> it should be fun. All right. Is that it, Yvonne? That's it. Okay. Well, then I am going to go back to... Um, Jean and ask her to please do our closing prayer, our benediction. This is wonderful. Thanks, Michelle. Let us turn within. And I want to give great thanks today for this incredible message from Rev. Michelle and to be reminded of our forever capacity of connectedness in peace, love, and in kindness. I'm thankful that we all have had the opportunity to experience this connectedness today and that we continue to do so throughout the week. And an extra thank you to Tony for joining us today. I feel really blessed and um, enlivened by her gift of music. And thank each and every one of you for, for being here today. And as always, you're blessed and a blessing. And so it is. Wonderful, thank you, Jean, beautiful. Okay, Tony. Take us out with some, some more musical inspiration. So um, if I may, I just, I always like to give credit to uh, the musicians who, um, I'm sorry, I'm not finding my music here. Oh, there it is. Okay. I always, I always like to give credit to the musicians. Um, so Guy on My Feet is an old traditional hymn by um, Wendell Whalum. And I Love Myself was a collaboration between Jai Josephs and Louise Hay. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, Louise introduced me to the teaching. So I'm, I'm very partial to and, re for, and grateful for her and the music that she introduced me to. And um, this last song that I'm going to do um, was written by Brennis McKenzie, who is a um, fabulous composer. She's from the um, church in, um, hold on, the place outside of San Francisco. Can't uh, think of the name of the town. I apologize. San Jose? No. <laughs> anyway. Santa Rosa. Nope. Um, Golden Gate, um, Tara Linda. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> I'm from that neck of the woods, I should know. And and the um, wonderful, wonderful um, musician um, who does my tracks is Richard Cummings, you know? And so I just always like to give credit and honor and acknowledge the people who um, supply us with this amazing music. So wonderful. I didn't know that, I, you know, I've heard I love myself the way I am, you know, forever, but I didn't realize that Louise Hay co-wrote it. That's yeah. thank you for telling me that. Thank you. Well, Louise. they had some kind of issue years afterwards. I don't know what it was, but they did. I mean, like I said, I was there way back. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. I love the song. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so this is I Will Follow Love. Perfect. I'm always amazed at the synchronicity that happens.
I will hold your hand and our fears will hide with our mighty love only peace will find love saved me love raised me with a holy view i'll know what to do love is born anew Love saved me, love raised me, with a holy view, I'll know what to do, love is born anew. That was beautiful. What a perfect way to bring the, the service, the message of love to, to a wonderful completion. Thank you so much, Tony. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for your talk. It was so inspiring for me. Oh, you're so welcome. And I, I really appreciate that and appreciate um, you coming and I know we'll be seeing you again. So um, I want to thank Jean for her benediction and for being our sound person. I want to thank Leslie, our practitioner of the day. I don't know if you can hear my dog barking in the back, but <laughs> thank you, Wally, for not barking during the service. I appreciate that. Uh, and thank you, everyone that's in attendance today. Um, we had my son on for some added testosterone. I see we now have Jim. Hi, Jim. And we have Ty on too. So. <laughs> And um, please give generously to our center. I, I would really appreciate it. We want to continue to be a viable um, part of your life, um, to bring uh, the teachings of the science of mind and to bring some new events that we're uh, planning to do in person now that we can move out of this. All right, all. Um, we're